Okay, this evening I'd like to continue the idea we had last week, and let me restate it. There are two principal ideas, the good and the idea of the good. And when we use the word idea, I'm sure everyone now knows that the word idea means to behold. So, there are two major ideas. The good, sometimes called the good of the one. And then this curious thing, which is really what would it be like to behold the good? And that's called to behold the good or the idea of the good. I have several quotes where you'll see that you can't use the idea of idea, that is to say you can't use it as a concept or a thought. And that will become even more clear as I go on and make a couple of quotes. Now, in the realm of Platonic thought, this is the limit of the known. The good of the one is beyond knowledge. Now, what we're interested in just quickly reviewing, the idea of the good is often called the most brilliant light of being. And that's that divine radiance. sometimes called luminosity. And when it is experienced, when it's experienced, it's reported universally as uh, an intensely blissful, and it takes on the name of beauty itself. Not something beautiful, but beauty itself. And when it is encountered, therefore, it is something. The beauty is not an artificial thing, therefore it has an intense vitality to it. And it comes on like an intense insight. And therefore, three words are often used to describe it. Is or being, vitality, and intelligence. Sometimes that's lumped together and called mind with a capital M. Now, I would like to collapse that and talk about just the good of the one and some some terms that Plato uses so that we can collapse it all with two images. Now first, this is actually the origin of the sun in the visible world. And therefore, it's the origin not only of the sun, but also its light. Now that's the light of the sun. So therefore, in Plato, the idea of the good, or what we just described, that's the limit of what can be known. And it, see, it has a power to give birth to the sun and the light that emanates from the sun. Therefore, it's not a concept or a thought. A thought or a concept can't do that. And therefore, he talks about this, uses a special term for it. He calls it the queen. And therefore, he really has two sets of terms that I'm going to introduce. He calls, see, we can say, well, the king and queen, that's a royal couple. That's a royal couple. 
the king, the queen. Now, in the visible world, we can talk about the king as the sun and light as its queen. So we have two royal pairs in the visible world and in the metaphysical world. Now, let me give you a quick quote, pull it together. Book seven. He introduces it with a, a cautionary note. At least what appears to me is that in the world of the known, last of all is the idea of the good. And with what toil to be seen, and seen this must be inferred to be the cause of all right and beautiful things for all. See, that's the cause of all right and beautiful things, because all things participate in this, and to the degree that they participate in it, to that degree, they are, can be said to be beautiful. Mountains, trees, gumballs, kittens, rag dolls, and things of that nature. Right? So, to whatever degree you call things beautiful, they participate in this in the same way, so too things that are considered right, or in that higher sense of right, righteousness. Now, watch the way he talks about it now. And, and the last, right, last of all to be seen is the idea of the good and with what toil to be seen. And seen, this must be inferred to be the cause of all right and beautiful things for all, which gives birth to light and the king of light in the world of sight. The world of sight, king, gives birth to the king in the world of sight. And obviously, to light would be its matching queen. Which gives birth to light and the king of light in the world of sight. And in the world of mind herself, the queen produces truth and reason. And she must be seen by one who is to act with reason publicly and privately. Therefore, this becomes the Queen. This becomes the king. In the visible world, this the sun, this light. Now, once we have established that from Plato, we can say that is an interesting set of terms that he uses to collapse all of this. Now, how can we approach an understanding of it? Well, Plotinus takes this image and he advances this note which I introduced last week. The way the king and the queen may relate to one another in the visible world, we will make most ideal. That is to say, they're going to be a divine couple on earth. Therefore, we're going to present them most ideally. And the way to present them most ideally is to talk about that relationship in terms of beauty and love. And knowing. I'm going to add a few more terms later. Now, what will that do? That will give us an insight into the everyday world where people experience love and interrelationships. So we're going to advance this thought with Plotinus. If you want to understand how the good and the one relates to the idea of the good, then consider this royal pair, the good, the idea of the good, 
as if they were a royal pair, king and queen, and treat them as if you would the experience of love on the highest possible level. So therefore, he's going to talk about love on at least four levels. The highest, the way in which the idea of the good and the good relates can still be grasped under the image of love. The way uh, in the visible world the king and queen relate, we can still talk about the most ideally. In the visible universe, we can talk about it in terms of men and women. And in the realm of uh, philosophy, as looking at it in terms of the soul, the way the soul can be said to relate to the queen, soul the man can relate to the queen, and the uh, royal couple, which is the idea of the good, and how from that it then relates to the king, and therefore, uh, the image of love runs right through this as well. So we have one, two, three, four orders. Now, I'm in book uh, uh, six, essay seven again of Plotinus. And there's a great deal in that. There's actually 42 sections. I'm only going to pull from several of them these ideas and bring them together, hopefully, into a unity. So that's the goal. So um, there's a great deal in this, and I'm going to um, pick it up at. Uh, Section 30, 31, 32, 33. And notice the language, therefore, that he uses. I'm going to quote several things and go back here and work it out on the board. Um, now, he wants to talk, now, when he talks about the queen, he will talk about intelligence and he'll call it intellect. So, soul, intellect, the good or the one, so that's why he's going to talk about it. Then occasionally he'll talk about it as being, but most often he'll talk about it in terms of intellect. What does he mean by intellect? That faculty in man which is capable of seeing into the nature of ultimate reality. Seeing what? Hmm? Seeing what? The nature of ultimate reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now he's going to talk quickly about the realm of the intellect. It's going to have three particular qualities to it. One is it has the, it has the ability to turn upon itself. It also has the ability to turn upon what is generated from it, which is really soul. So, but, and it also has the ability to turn upon what is higher. So it has three motions, as it were. It can turn upon itself, right? what is generated from it, and its higher function, which is to gain an insight into the nature of the good and the one. Those are its three particular functions. For there in the realm of intellect is true delight and the greatest satisfaction, the most loved and longed for, which is not in a process of becoming nor in movement, but its cause is what colors and shines upon and glorifies the intelligibles. That's why Plato adds truth to the mixture and puts uh, what measures it before it, good proportion, beauty. Right. So we should, I'm skipping, so we should in accordance, all right, so we should be according to this and have our parts in it but in another way, 
what is really worth aspiring to for us is ourselves. Bringing ourselves back, right? Bring ourselves back from ourselves to the best of ourselves. This is well proportioned, beautiful, and the form which is not part of the composite and the clear, intelligent, beautiful life. So let me make, a little, make that a little clearer. Right? He's saying, what's going on here, we should apply here. And therefore, what's going on here should equally be applied here. We should know ourselves. We should aspire for what is higher. Huh? And in that way, we should also care for things that we ourselves are in charge of. Similar dynamics, similar dynamics. Okay, now it goes back to the intellect. But since all things were made beautiful by that which was before them and, and held its light, intellect held the resplendence of its intelligent activity with which it illuminated its nature. And soul held power to live since the greater life came to it. So light comes to intellect as life comes to soul. So intellect was raised to that height and stayed there, happy in being around the good. But the soul also, which was able uh, to turn to it, and when it knew and saw it, rejoiced in that vision, and so far as it was able to see, was utterly amazed at what it saw. It saw as in utter amazement, and since it held something of it in itself, it had an intimate awareness of it and came into a state of longing. Like those, now he's going to shift down, like those who are moved by an image of the loved one to wish to see that same beloved, and just as here below, those who are in love shape themselves in the likeness of the beloved and make their bodies handsomer and bring their souls into likeness, since as far as they can, they do not want to fall short of the integrity of all the other excellence of the loved one, for if they did, uh, they would be rejected by the loved ones. And these are the lovers who are able to have intercourse. In this way, the soul also loves the good, moved by it to love from the beginning. Hey, look here. Just as there is a activity of the lover right, shaping himself to be acceptable to the beloved, right, so on the next level, the soul wants to therefore get to know intellect, it too must shape itself for that interrelationship or intercourse. Uh, this is a physical intercourse, this is a metaphysical intercourse. He's saying the same relations hold for both levels. Let me give another one which is very interesting in that respect. When it sees the beauties here flowing past it, it already knows completely that they have the light which plays on them from elsewhere. And then it is born away, skilled in finding what it loves, and not leaving off till it catches it, unless someone were to take even its love away. There certainly it sees that all things are beautiful and true and gains greater strength since it's filled with a life of real being, and has become really, truly real itself, and also gains true awareness, and it perceives that it's nearer to what it has been long than seeking. So he moves back and forth between talking about love and the conditions for love on the physical plane, and how it translates into the need to gain that same kind of relationship in respect to the intellect or the idea of the good. There certainly it sees that all things are beautiful and true and gains greater strength since it's filled with the love of real being and has become truly real itself also. 
and has true awareness, and it perceives that it's near to what it has long been seeking. The same language can apply to the three. Well, if the same language can be applied to three, now we're going to see whether we can raise the level of awareness of the lover, and it won't make much difference whether we're talking about this, this, or this. Watch the way he uses the language. There's um, two steps to this, and I'd like to I'd like to move ahead to it, but I think it's going to take me a couple of steps. Yeah, okay, I'll take me a couple of steps. All right. Where then is he who made the beauty which is so great and the life which is so great? One can ask in this relationship, or when one tries to purify the soul, or, getting a, or having experienced this, that these are different degrees of beauty. Is it not possible that, let's call that person, that entity that goes through these, th these things, the lover? Can he not ask this very question? Hey, I'm in love with this, this beauty. Right? Where did that beauty come from? What is its source? What's its source? What happens when the person engages in that kind of an inquiry? Where do they go with it on any one of those levels? You see, the beauty which rests upon forms, all of them richly varied, it's beautiful to abide here. Right? It's beautiful to abide here, here. Here, it's beautiful to abide here. But, one is, but when one is in beauty, one must look to see whence this beauty comes and whence it derives the beauty. Uh, this itself must not be any one of them. For then it will be one of them. It will be a part. There's something great about this. He calls that the problem, the, the, the greatness. But the greatness is, is that nothing can be... Well, no, okay. I, I'm, I guess I want to go faster than I should. Um, So let me calm down for a moment, okay? <laughs> he says, look here, here's the problem, you see. In these relationships, one must experience a sense of greatness in the relationship, in the beloved. Right? And the relation itself then gains a greatness. Now you have two questions. Where did the beauty come from and where did the greatness come from? Now he's going to deal with this kind of talk. Whatever is the source of this must not itself be it, but it must be something higher that generated it. Therefore, he's going to search out for the higher, the source. When he does that, then you're going to get another view of love which is even higher than what he's already developed. So let me get there. Truly, when you cannot grasp the shape of what is longed for, it would be most longed for and is most lovable. And love for it would be immeasurable. So when you're involved in trying to grasp the form of the beloved, right, is it not likely that 
a deeper love would be to recognize the form, but to go beyond the form and try to in some way grasp the nature of the person. So you have to get away from the form or shape, even in the midst of the loving, and try to discover the nature of what it is you love. So you have to go beyond form and shape. When you cannot grasp the, the shape of what is longed for, it would be most longed for and most lovable. And love for it would be immeasurable. Now he moves from immeasurable to unbounded. For love is not limited here because neither is the beloved. But the love of this kind would be unbounded. So his love is of another kind and a beauty that is far above beauty. Now then what, what beauty can it be? But if it is lovable, it would be the generator of beauty. Wait a minute, the source of it must be lovable must be the source of beauty. Conclusion. Therefore, the productive power of all is the flower of beauty, which is what makes beauty. Therefore, that which participates in beauty is shaped, but not the beauty. The beauty is immeasurable. Therefore, the primary beautiful, then, and the first is without form. And beauty is that which is nothing other than the nature of the good. The experience of lovers bears witness to this, that as long as it is in that which has the impression perceived by the senses, the lover is not yet in love. But when from that he himself generates in himself an impression not perceptible by the senses, then love springs up. Right? So he's going beyond the physical form. But he seeks to see the beloved that he may water him when he's withering, which is an expression that comes from Plato's Phaedrus. But if he should come to understand that one must change to that which is more formless, he would desire that. But as his experience from the beginning was love of a great light from a dimmer light. So what is that that produces the longing? And we shall no longer be surprised if that which produces these strange, powerful longings is altogether free from even intelligible shape. Since the soul also, when it gets an intense love, puts away all the shape which it has, even whatever shape of the intelligible there, there, there may be in it. For it's not possible for one who has anything else and is actively occupied about it to see or be fitted in. One must not have any evil or any other good either. The soul alone may receive it alone. All right, let me do that again. That's a very beautiful concept. All right, under what condition can you love when you're empty of everything else? For it is not possible for one who has anything else, right, who has anything else, and is actively occupied about it, to see or to be fitted in. But one must not have evil or good either, any other good either, ready at hand, that the soul along alone may receive it alone.
But when, now he's shifting now to the soul. You'll see the same language. But when the soul has good fortune with it and it comes to it, or rather, being already there, appears when the soul turns away from these things that they are there and has prepared by making itself as beautiful as possible and has come to likeness. The preparation and the adornment are clearly understood, I think, by those who are preparing themselves. And it sees it in itself suddenly appearing. This is a parenthesis. For there is nothing between, nor are they still two at this point, but both are one. Nor could you still make a distinction while it's present. Lovers and their beloveds here below imitate this in their will to be united. It does not still perceive its body that is in it and does not speak of itself as anything else, not man, not living thing, not being. Why? It has been seeking it and meets that very thing when it is present and looks at that instead of itself, doesn't look at itself anymore. It is not even time to see who the soul is that looks. There, truly, it would not exchange us for anything in the world when it has its beloved. Not even if someone handed over the whole universe to it, because there's nothing still better, nothing uh, that is more good, for it doesn't run up higher and all other things are on the way down from it, even if they are in the realm above. So then it has the ability to judge rightly and to know that this is what it desired and to establish that there is nothing better than it. What it speaks then is that. And it speaks afterwards, speaks in silence, and in its happiness, it's not cheated in thinking that it is happy. I was going from the soul to the intellect. Yet when the soul has become intellect, it contemplates when it has been, so to, speed, so to speak, made intellect and has come to be in the intelligible place. But when it has come to be in it, moves about it, it possesses the intelligible and thinks that when it sees that God, it at once lets everything go. How shall I describe it? Now watch the way he describes it. All right, let me go back and cover it before I give the example. This is where I wanted to go before. For it says that he whom it sees doesn't move either. Yet when his soul has become intellect, it contemplates. And when it has, has been, so to speak, made intellect, it has come to be in the intelligible place. But when it has come to be in it, and moves about it, it possesses the intelligence and thinks. But when it sees the God, it at once lets everything go. Therefore, he's now moving from here to here, to the good. Now, look at the way he does it. This is a very lovely image. It is as if someone went into a house richly decorated and so beautiful, and within it contemplated each and every one of the decorations and admired them before seeing the master of the house. But when he sees the master with delight, who is not of the nature of the images in the house, but worthy of genuine contemplation, he dismisses all those other things thereafter and looks at him alone. And then he looks and doesn't take his eye away. By the continuity of his contemplation, 
he no longer sees a sight, but mingles his seeing with what he contemplates, so that what was seen before has now become sight in him, and he forgets all other objects of contemplation. And perhaps the likeness would keep in conformity with the reality. If it was not a mortal who encountered the one who was seeing the sights in the house, but one of the gods. Intellect, then, has one power of thinking by which it looks at things in itself, and one by which it looks at what transcends it, the, the one, by a direct awareness and reception, by which also <clears throat> before it saw only, and by seeing acquired intellect and is one. And that first one is the contemplation of intellect, it's in its right mind. And the other is intellect and love. When it goes out of its mind, drunk with nectar, and folds in love, simplified into happiness by having its fill. Hey, it's better to be drunk with a drunkenness like this than to be mere uh, uh, respectable sober. But does that intellect see in part, and one time things, and another time of no, 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 no. But intellect always has its thinking, and always, uh, and always is not thinking, but looking at, at that God in another way. For when it saw him, it had offspring, it was intimately aware of their generation existence within it. And when it sees these, it's said to think. But it sees that by the power of which it was going to think. But the soul sees in a kind of confused and nulling way. But the God is spread out over them. And Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll do two more lines. But the soul sees by a kind of confusing and annulling the intellect which abides within it. But rather, its intellect sees first, and the vision comes also to it, and the two become one. But the good is spread out over them and fitted in to the union of both, playing upon them and uniting the two. It rests upon them and gives them a blessed perception and vision, lifting them so high that they're not in place nor in anything other. Okay, 36. Um, I'll, I'll hold that, 36 for a moment. All right. So, what is he doing? He's describing this love, human love, in the most ideal terms, then he's saying, look here, what you do there, you have to do within yourself to your own psyche or soul. If you want to gain an insight into this realm of the idea of the good, intellect, the same dynamics here, here is applied here. The same dynamics apply here to here. What does that do? If we went back and looked at it, you know, the real test would be, what kind of a love would this be if you could take the best of all of this and work it backwards and see what would happen here? Now that would be quite interesting. Well, that's the challenge of understanding. Um, but how does he describe, before we do that, how does he describe the good itself? We talked about how to get there through love, the way he describes it. So in 36, he's going to talk about just the good. Uh, something has been said about this, but all the same, even now, we must speak of it a little. Starting from that experience, 
proceeding by rational discourse, where he starts. The knowledge or touching of the good is the greatest thing. Plato says it's the greatest study. Not calling that looking it a study, but learning about it beforehand. We're taught about it by comparison, negations, and knowledge of the things which come from it, and certain methods of ascent by degrees. But we are put on the way to it by purifications and excellences and adornings, and by gaining footholds in the intelligible and setting ourselves. But whoever has become at once contemplator of himself and all the rest, and the object of his contemplation, and since he has become substance and intellect, and the complete living being, he no longer looks at it from the outside. When he has become this, he's near. And that good is next above him. It's already close. Shining upon all the intelligible world. It is there that one lets all study go. Up to the point, one has been led along and, and, and settled firmly in beauty as far as this one thinks that in which one is. But it's carried out by a surge of the wave of intellect itself. And it's lifted on high by a kind of swell. And it sees suddenly, not seeing how, but the vision fills his eyes with light and he doesn't make and, and uh, does not make him see something else by it, but the light itself is what he sees. For there is not in the good something seen and its light, nor intellect and the object of intellect, but a ray which generates these afterwards and lets them besides it. But he himself is the ray which only generates intellect and doesn't distinguish itself in the generation. But it itself abides, and that intellect comes to be because this good exists. Now, let's just jump back and create, see what we can do. We have enough. Let's take that and put it over here. Oh. Pursuit. Engagement. Right. Now, in the language he's using, he's saying that if this is true, it's not the form that the person loves, or if it is, that's not love. You have to see behind or beyond that to find that which is beautiful. You have to reach beyond the form, and that is immeasurable. There's a power to it. It's unlimited. And if it is grasped, if it is grasped, it's like going through the physical beauty and finding something that's immeasurably more. He says, if that doesn't take place, that's not love. Oh, take the next step. Right. Let's just quickly pull it together. It's unbounded. Therefore, what is the source of that? He says, the source of that, the source of that beauty that one is engaged in is not resident in the thing, 
The experience of lovers bears witness to this, that as long as it is in that which The experience of lovers bears witness to this, that as long as it is in that which has the impression perceived by the senses, the lover is not yet in love. If he has an impression of her, right, then he just loves a impression. He's caught up an impression of a form. Shape. Huh? Yeah, that's, not, that's not what it's in. For the uh, primarily beautiful, then, is, is, is without form. So if it's without form, see, if it's without form, unlimited, immeasurable power, these are the key terms that describe the good, the nature of the good. Therefore, one gets an intimation of a higher reality through, through a romantic relationship. The primary beautiful, then, and the first, is without form, and beauty is that, the nature of the good. The experience of lovers bears witness to that. So long as it's in that which has the impression perceived by the senses, the lover's not yet in love. But when from that he himself generates in himself an impression not perceptible by the senses, right? if he himself generates in himself an impression that's not perceptible, it springs up, then love springs up. Right? An impression not of the form. If he gets an impression of this, then that's when love springs up. That's metaphysics. So you're looking at something, beauty. You're going, trying to discover the source of it. If you get an impression of this, not a form, not a shape, then that's when love springs up in the individual. When that happens, just to pull it together. But he should come to understand that one must change to that which is more formless. Therefore, he then has to change to become more like this. He himself, therefore, has to drop ego masks, right? pretenses, forms, shapes, manners, right? To become self, become formless. He must come to understand that one must change to that which is more formless. For he would desire that. For his experience from the beginning was a love of a great light from a dimmer. For the trace of the shapeless is shape. It is this which generates shape. So from this, you gain an insight into this. Behind this is this. It's a shadow. This is a shadow of this, an intimation of it. If then what is lovable is not the matter, but what is formed by the form, and the form upon matter comes from the soul, and the soul is more form and more lovable. Intellect is more form than soul and still more lovable. One must assume that the first nature of beauty then is formless. So we shouldn't be surprised if that which produces these strangely powerful longings is altogether free from shape, even intelligible shape. And so by, by, by being prepared, by making itself as beautiful as possible, it has come to a likeness. 
The preparation and the adornment are clearly understood, I think, by those who are preparing themselves. And it sees it in itself suddenly appearing, for there's nothing between, nor are they still two, but they become one. They become one. He's now adorning himself, trying to be more like that. This, therefore, is a wanting process. Lovers and their beloveds here below imitate this in their will to be united. It does not still perceive the body that is in it. it. Doesn't speak of itself as anything else, not man or living being or anything else. It has no time for them nor wants them. It has been seeking it and meets that when it's present and looks at that instead of itself. It, does, it has not even the time to see who, who the soul is that looks. That is to say, in our language, we would say, uh, well, excuse me for taking that out. It, he, forgets himself. Huh. Forgets himself. Doesn't even have time to see who it is that sees and looks at that instead of itself. He looks at that instead of itself. In this state then, remember the quote we said? It would not take anything in this state, it wouldn't take anything in exchange for that experience. There's nothing better. Everything else from this is down. Then it falls in love, simplified into happiness by having its fill. task was, I'm skipping a bit here, our task was to see first of all whether or not he uses physical love as a way of exploring these two levels. Whether or not he uses this language to talk about the dynamics of the soul, how the soul enters into this intelligible region, which is beauty itself, and from there to the good, the highest. And if he does use that language, we suggested, what would it be like then if we take these progressive views of love and then return it back to the physical? And that's what I wanted to introduce. So I'd be quite anxious to hear your comments, and I'll stop reading. Otherwise, I'll go back to the book. said what beauty is? Have we said what the good is? Mm. Um, I did sneak a quote in and uh, curiously enough um, in Plato and in Plotinus which I can read he says, you know what, he says, 
all the faculties right, of knowing, of apprehending, right, sight has a certain power, and through that power it allows us to see the visible. And so too with all the senses. So you know what he says? Opinion, opinion is a power. It allows you to discover the visible world and to make judgments about the visible world. Judgments about it as different from sight. Huh? Understanding is a power. And that allows you to be able to judge what can be said about the intelligible world. Uh, and that's the idea of the good. Okay. Is that intellect is a power that allows you to confirm what it is you think you understand about the intelligible world in your own experience. It's a direct participation and awareness. Love is a power through which then you learn that there is a way of uniting and coming together under certain circumstances and conditions at various levels. It admits of degrees, as all of these do. Is it the good itself? The good itself is power itself. And these are all radiations of the good. That's the only term he uses for it. power. And he then says, it's self-sufficient, of course, needing nothing and other qualities that go along with it. But the, the only positive assertion he makes about it is that it's a, it's a power. And a power that presupposes that it contains all that in its pure state. And therefore, the diminution of power creates these different levels of our apprehension or apprehending. I think that's what I just said. I thought you were referring to Plato. Oh, Plato in places of my, my, I think says the same. But isn't that giving them some quality to it? I thought yeah. It mm -hmm. I thought it didn't have any. Yeah. Uh, in Parmenides, it's uh, unlimited. And bound. No. Well, the question is, what is it you're talking about when you're saying it's unlimited? Now, that we're, we're mixing systems. In Parmenides' first hypothesis, he just says it's unlimited. Uh, the image that we get here in the Republic right, is, a, is a regal, a king power. Right? King, queen, royal couple. Well, that's a power. I think I can get it for you if I... Uh... Yeah, just jump in and... and uh, while I'm looking for it, I know where it is. I just... Something is unlimited. 
in the Parmenides. Yeah. I thought unlimited was necessarily uh, connected to To what? To what? Say it again. If you talk about something being unlimited, yeah. in the sense, in that sense that you were talking about it unlimited, you were bounding it. Isn't that the the first? Uh, you're, in, you're saying that you are assigning some quality to it, and that's binding it. Or, right. Right. Okay. But it's unlimited. What kind of a bound would that be? Still negative. Still negative. So, <coughs> that would, so that wouldn't be attributing anything to it then? Well, that's one of the... This question comes up in Proclus, which is... But yes, that's true. Um, how to understand that becomes a big issue for Proclus. <laughs> Yeah, you're not talking loud enough for me, so I if you... It, yes, please. To say it has a power, or if it, there's a power. Oh. Well, what my understanding of power is, something. Unless he means power in a different way. Um, remember, we were on greatness. Let me let me read you a sentence. Let me uh, talk about being in one way first. In English, this word, substance, is that which stands under something. Right. The word that they're going to use as being is not something that stands under something, but it's that which has the capacity to turn upon itself. See, all of these has the power to turn upon itself and to seek that which is the source of itself in something higher. That turning upon itself, that turning about, is in the nature of reality. Reality has that capacity of turning about. Which is where the Christians get the word repentance, by the way. Uh, to turn the mind about is literally the word for repentance. Okay, this turning about aspect of the nature of reality is usia, is a Greek word. Right? Now the question in this reading, why I'm saying that is, is he talking about being as usia, or is he talking about the nature of the one or the good? All right. Um, He's talking about the source of beauty. Beauty is the term given for the nature of beauty itself, the intellect. Now, if you allow me the freedom, I'll just scan this paragraph and get down to the key quote. Where then is he who made the beauty which is so great 
and the life which is so great. He who is the generator of substance. That word. So, who is it that made the beauty? The life, vitality, same word. Who see it? Who made it? Right? What's, what's the source? Now he goes through a, a, a long paragraph. I'll see if I can get a couple of key ones. The principle, the principle, is the formless, not that which needs form, but that from which every intelligent form comes. It's the source. For what came to be, if it did come to be, came to be something and had its own particular shape. But who could have made what no one made? Therefore, it's none of these things and all of them, none of them because real beings are later. But all of them because they come from it. Now, he would be unbounded but if unbounded, have no size, for there is size in the last and the lowest of things. And even if he makes size, he himself must not have it. <clears throat> and the greatness of substance, Usia, is not quantitative, but something else, posterior. But, but his greatness, is that nothing can be more powerful than him, and nothing can be compared with him. For t to what that belongs to him, could anything come to equality which has nothing the same? <clears throat> Let me reread that. I don't like the way I read it. But his greatness is that nothing can be more powerful than him, and nothing can be compared with him. For to what that belongs to him, could anything come to equality which has nothing the same? And then now he, he um, But his greatness is that nothing can be more powerful than him, and nothing can be compared with him. Does that help? And this, this might be the difference between Plotinus, Plato, and Proclus. Right. And that's where he goes into, all right, it has all these qualities of being without form and unlimited and immeasurable. What? Then, then that's really what is longed for. And the lover then tries to match those qualities within himself. And in doing that, he is transformed into that very thing. And that process becomes one, and it becomes one. So can I say that the creator of substance is the idea of the good? And then can I say that the creator of metanoia is the good? Um, yeah, uh, one thing, okay? The word creator implies a doing. A doing. The way he gets out of that... Yeah, the emanation saves that. But like, whatever it is, the radiance around it, what you call the emanation, is what we call intellect. Right? what we call the idea of the good, what we call beauty. The idea of the good could also be metaphorically the logos or the, or the queen, yes? The what? The, the logos or the queen. Well, the, the queen is the radiance, right? is the brilliance. 
of the king, if you want to use that language. The necessary emanation, that property, that's radiance. That's the idea of the good or the queen. That's the idea of the good. And therefore, when it's beheld, it's beheld as beauty. Then you said, what is possibly, what could possibly be the source of such beauty? And then he goes into that great example of the house, when you walk into the house and find all those beautiful things, and you stop and say, where did, whoa, how did they get here? What's the cause of all of that? Then you find the owner of the house, and you're startled by a different kind of beauty, because then you recognize the source of it. And you forget and drop all the things that you formerly regarded as beautiful. And the idea of the good. And that is a metanoia kind of experience. Yes. I don't want, I mean, it's unfortunately, I don't even think you could experience the right word. Is it is. Well, see, the metanoia, literally, it's the metanoia. Yeah, uh, is um, to, turn, to turn the inner mind around. And the image comes from um, uh, target practice when you're shooting arrows or sh a rifle, and you miss the, you miss the target, you hit the target. If, if you miss the target, then you have to turn your mind around, ignore all those dis things that are distracting you, Just turn your mind around to keep, your, to keep you from hitting the mark, the target. To miss the target, literally, is sin. A marchion, which means to miss the mark. Mistake. Yeah, yeah, mistake. Right. So in Christianity, the actual words, you know, baptism, repentance, for remission of sins, this is uh, uh, repentance is to turn the mind around. Remission is to free to free oneself from missing the mark. To keep from missing the mark, making mistakes, requires that you turn the mind around. That's a metanoia. That's a turning about, which some people translate in the old days as repentance, and it stayed in English, though no one knows what it means anymore because it's a term no one uses independently of the Christian context. Therefore, it lost its meaning. But that's its original meaning. And that is akin to be, be the yeah, you see, in Christianity, that is something that people do to keep from missing the mark. In Greek thought, that's the very nature of reality, that capacity of reality to turn upon itself and to reflect and to change and to, and, and to bring about a higher state of being. So it moves from a psychological condition to a very part and parcel of the nature of reality on all levels. Well, thank you for letting me experiment with this. Um, this is the first time I've explored this really in this way. I, uh, I'd like to go back to it some other time and pull some more quotes together, but I think we're introduced it. So thank you.